everyone. Jerry just let me know we're now live on our church Facebook page. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of our Wednesday night Bible study here in our beautiful church sanctuary at South Haven First United Methodist. I got a great group of folks here tonight. We've got a great group of folks that great group of folks at home who are watching and being a part of this with us. So thank you all so much for being a part of our study tonight. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. We're not going to finish chapter 3, but we're going to finish the first seven verses, okay? Still a lot we're trying to un unwrap within all this. Well, while you're going to Genesis chapter 3, once again, let us now, as we share in all things in our life, let's give this time of study to God. Let's pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, we are honored and blessed to be here together, one with each other, with you. We are with you here and inside your beautiful sanctuary, while at the same time we are with you as we gather before our computers and, and watch through the gift of the internet and our online Facebook page. And together, dear God, we are one, one with each other, with you, and we thank you for this time. So through the power of your spirit now, bless us and anoint us as only you and you alone can do. Once again, let this be about you. Let you lead, dear God. Let us keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and ears upon you. As you share with us tonight, as we continue on through this great story here in the book of Genesis. And we ask all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so once again, join me verses 1 through 7 of chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of, it, eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. All right, so you remember last week we talked about two things concerning the serpent, who the serpent really is. And, you know, we talked about is this just a symbolic thing that representing evil? Was this actually Satan in disguise? But the third thing we talked about, which I truly believe it is, is that this is actually the serpent. He is the wisest, cleverest craftiest animal that God has created. And what he is allowing himself to do is to be used as an instrument, a mouthpiece of the devil. And we talked about that. And we can then conclude how very smart he really is. And we discovered in four ways. First off, we talked about the fact that when he asked the woman the question there in that first part of verse, or the last part of verse 1, that the question cannot be answered simply with a yes or no answer. It is a question that draws you into a conversation. You have to explain your answer. We also talked about the fact that, you know, there is no fear, no surprise or concern between, you know, coming upon the woman having a conversation with a serpent. It's as if it's always something that's been going on between them. But more importantly, coming across this way, he's not a villain. He's not a bad guy. He is, central, he is basically a mutual observer between the relationship between God and humans. We talked about he's smart because he didn't go after the man. Because the man heard the commandment directly from God. He goes to the woman who heard it secondhand. But fourth, we talked about the fact he is smart that within this in talking and having this conversation, he is now planting seeds of doubt concerning God in the woman's mind. So now let us pick up again, continue to look at the last part of verse 2, but going on into 3. So it's with this very clever question that we can now begin to see the seeds of doubt begin to grow in the mind of the woman. Satan, Satan is starting to do to her 
what he desires to do to all of us. To make us doubt, you know, the specific purpose of God's commands for us. To wonder if God is holding something back from us. Or if God, is he really being fair when he gives us all these commandments? And as a result of all this doubt, Satan, in fact, he, even, he gets even more from the woman that he had ever even hoped for. So in looking at this, look now at verse 3. Now, in response to the question that the serpent slash Satan asked her, the woman responds with two answers that we really do not expect. Two answers that we didn't expect her to say. Now, look at the first part of verse 3 and her first response to the question. Her first response in verse 3 is, You shall not, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that where." In the middle of the garden, okay? Now, what is off? What's off concerning this answer from the woman? What's off here? What's, what's different? When it comes to God, how does, what is God, how does God, how does God refer to the tree? He calls it the what? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the way God has always called it. He calls it the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the question becomes, why does the woman refer to the tree in a different way? And, of course, the answer comes from another question. So she, she's doing this because she is now placing the tree where? She's now placing the tree where? Okay, I, of course the scriptures say that. i got to give you that in this soon. <laughs> okay. But think about it in a little different way. She's also placing the tree where? In comparison to the other trees, she's placing the tree where? Equal. On the same level. Just like all the other trees in the garden. You're right. Scripture says in the middle. And you can't, I can't go against Scripture. But what she's actually doing, like I said, she's placing that tree on the same level. Which means what? That first off, she's beginning to doubt the importance of the what? Tree. Of the tree. She's doubting how important it is. But second, she's beginning to doubt the importance of God's what concerning the tree? His command. She's doubting the importance of the tree. She's beginning to doubt the importance of God's command. The thing is, now, isn't this exactly what sin wants us to think about sin? This is why sin wants us to see itself, that there is really no difference between it and what God desires for us to do. You see, sin wants us to do this. Sin wants us to place it on the same level as everything else. So we'll end up doing what? Taking it for what? Taking it for granted. Taking it for A little bit won't hurt. A little bit won't hurt. But the most, the worst thing of all is we start focusing, well, we, I should say this, we no longer focus on the what? The harm that the sin can bring into our lives. That's what happens when we just take sin and put it on the same level as everything else. We take it for granted. We begin to doubt whether it's sin or not. We don't think about the harm, okay? But now look at the second part of verse 3. Now what should stand out to us concerning the woman's second response concerning the truth? All right, so what stands out about that? God never said that. In his command, God never once commanded the woman, the man or woman, to touch the tree. His command was simply to not do what? Eat of the fruit. Eat of the fruit of the tree. So the question now becomes this. Why does the woman add this? Why does she add this to her answer, you know, to, her answer to the question? Well, there's three possibilities. First, it's quite possible that the woman kind of could have gotten this response from who? Yeah. Well, from the man. Very well that she could have gotten a response from the man. The man might have told her, so she would do what? Stay away from the tree. Now, remember we talked about the fact how the serpent, serpent, Satan, is so smart that he goes after the woman because she got it secondhand knowledge. What if the serpent went after the man first? 
What if he went after the man first and learned not to go after him? The thing is, and then what if the man then on purpose tells a woman, oh, don't even touch it. You know, don't, don't touch it. Don't go anywhere near it because he's trying to protect her, trying to keep her from falling into the trap that the serpent was trying to make him fall into. So it's very possible we do not know for sure, but it's a good reason that she got that from the man. But there's a second possibility. Are we seeing the woman just you know, showing us a human exaggeration? Is she just simply exaggerating about, you know, what's going on in a tent to make herself, you know, feel good about all this? You know, how many times do we do that? We exaggerate or we add something. It's just a human nature, isn't it? Trying to con do what? Convince herself what? To stay away from. That's a possibility. I'm not sure if I'm big on that one, but that's a possibility. But it's a good one. But there's the third one. Are we once again seeing doubt coming into play here? You see, if it is doubt, what would the woman be doubting at this point? God's word. God, okay. God's word, or better yet, who would she be doubting then? God. God. Is she beginning to doubt God? Is she beginning to think that God is seeking to deny something in her life? And as a result, she's now trying to make God out to be the one. The bad guy. Very words I wrote. <laughs> She's trying to make God out to be the bad guy in all this. You know, basically, well, he won't even let us touch it. You know, like a child does when a parent tells them, no, you know, they exaggerate and, and they get all mad and everything. Other words, you know, God really doesn't, you know, he just wants what is best for them. But they don't believe that. You know, God really doesn't want what's best for them because he's holding back something important, something that they want. And as a result, she's getting mad about it. And she's just, ex once again, exaggerating it all and to justify why they couldn't do this. But look at verses 4 and 5. Because the truth is this, we do not know why. We don't know why she changes the name. We don't really know why. She adds that part about not even touching it. Whatever the reason why the woman responds this way, it does not matter. Because as far as the serpent, as far as Satan is concerned, his question did what? It, 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 it worked. It did the job. It got her going. You see, he wanted the woman to believe that God has placed this restriction upon them because of God's own self. Interest. He wants them to think that this is a self-interest of God. Now look at verse 5. Now in this, what is the key statement, though, in the serpent or Satan's response to what the woman says? It's there in verse 5. It says, and you will be, or some may say, and you will become like what? God, knowing what? Knowing good and evil. What have we got here at this point? We now have the ultimate what? Okay, ultimate lie, but there's also something else going on here. Because we're going to get into that. Think about this for a minute. It's actually more than the ultimate lie. It's the ultimate what? Choice. Okay, not really. Okay, there's a choice involved. But what's the choice? If God is good, why did he put that down? Oh, okay, if God. Well, the thing is, and that may be going into like a testing or tempting thing, and we're going to talk about that too. We got the ultimate temptation here. That's what's really going on here. We have the ultimate temptation from the devil. You see, Satan not only wants us to become our own boss, he also wants us to do what? He wants us to do the one thing that he could not do, which is what? Become who? Take down a God. Become God. He wants you to feel that. He wants you, you know, uh, to place yourself into God's place. In your life. He wants you to become your own God. Because that's what he tried to do here. And by doing that, by doubting God, by making her question God, why did God put it there in the first place type stuff? You know, why did he do this to us? To begin to question and doubt so they could take God's place. They would become God. But now, okay, Jack, here we go. 
But what most importantly, though, should stand out about what the serpent or Satan is saying here that we need to especially be careful of, that he's actually making what kind of statement at this point? He's not telling a lie. He's actually telling the what? Truth. He's making a true statement at this point. Okay, okay, he's actually making a true statement. Of course, it's his own truth <laughs> that he wants you to hear, that he wants the woman to hear, you know, the serp, uh, that the serpent, Satan's telling them. But in a way, she will become like God, knowing what? Good and evil. The difference between good and evil. She won't become who? God. But can become like God. So in a way, he's not really telling a lie. He's actually using a true statement, which once again shows us what? Just how dangerous he really is. You see, the devil, Satan, that serpent, he can use not just lies, he is the king of all lies, but he also can use the truth. He can take a true statement and turn it around for his own benefit. Alma, it says, uh, for God knows that when the eye of it, the eyes will be open. Well, okay, yeah, uh-huh. You know uh that, you know, that eye, uh-huh. But you, you know, your eyes will be open and you will know the difference. They do, they will know the difference. So the thing is, there's really not a lie going on at this point. But now look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, okay? Her eyes have been opened. She is looking. Now, one thing you've got to understand. One time, you know, we think that this is kind of going bang, 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 bang. But that doesn't necessarily have to be what the case you know, what if she's just standing there now? She's pondering. She's thinking. The woman sees that the tree is good for food. It's a delight to her eyes. And she's beginning to try and wonder. She's trying to figure this out. Huh? It could have been a couple of days. We don't know. We don't have a timeline here. That's true. We don't know how long it actually occurs. But at this point, though, apparently, for the first time, the woman actually does what? She's actually now for the first time doing what? Taking a what? Taking a bite of the food? No, not taking a bite of it yet. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes, it apparently comes across as what? For the very first time, she's actually looking at what? She's look, looking at the tree. She's thinking about the tree. She's concentrating. For the very first time, she's taking a good, long, hard look at the tree. Like I said, we don't know how long it goes, okay? I mean, she she might have been in awe. She yeah. might have been in awe. Oh. Or apparently, or the other thing, she's never done this because of her fear. Up to this point, she's had a fear, along with the fear of God's command. So the thing is, up to this point, the way it sounds is that she never did even really take a look at it. Just kind of went by like this, you know. Don't want to really look at it out of fear. Yes, you know. What did it look like, you know? And, and Marilyn said, you know, diamonds or girls, that's where it could have looked like that. It, it could have looked like that, part. but, you know, and, well, the bottom line, we, we've always, what fruit have we said it was? An apple. But it's not, it couldn't have been an apple tree. I'll be honest with you, it couldn't be an apple tree because apple trees cannot grow in that climate and that soil. It could have been a date, a plum, or something like that. Never was an apple. All right, because apple trees cannot grow in those conditions there in that area where it is. But I'm not the thing is, but he put, remember when he created everything, he created it for an exact purpose. And you cannot go outside of that purpose. So if an apple tree, you know, was planted there, it is outside of its purpose, outside of where it was designed to be there. So the thing is, but you know, the bottom line is kind of get back on this now. For the first time, she apparently is taking a good look at it. But what was the biggest thing that appeals? to the woman at this point. As she looks at it, she sees that the tree is what? Huh? Okay, it's good for the eyes, but there's something even bigger than that. It's good for the eyes, that the tree was what? Desirable. Desirable to do what? Desirable to make one wise. All right, what's your say, Cheryl? For gaining wisdom. For gaining wisdom. All right, either way, it's, it's the same thing, which once again shows us what? That the woman 
is starting to really believe what? That God, that God is holding things back. That God doesn't want her to be wise. Here's a source of wisdom right here, a wisdom of knowledge of good and evil, and he won't even let us anywhere near it. We can't even touch it, which God never said not to touch it. So, so the thing is, once again, this is beginning to come into play. Now look at the last part of verse 6. So in taking a look at the tree for the first time, what's the first result? The first result is what? That she does what? She, okay, she took its fruit and ate. Now, what should stand out at this point of the story? Well, she gave her husband some. No, not yet. Don't go too far. Don't jump ahead of me. This is the first part. She took of its fruit and ate. What should stand out at this point of the story? That the serpent, that Satan did not do what? Huh? Yeah, he didn't force the fruit on her, Don. You ever notice that? He did not force her to eat. More importantly, he did not tell her what? To eat of it. He didn't even tell her to eat the fruit. He simply led her to the point, and then what happened? She, huh? She made up her own mind. Somebody said it a little bit earlier. I can't remember. She made the choice. Who said that earlier? She makes the choice. She makes up her own mind. She makes the choice then on her own to do this. And that's what temptation is. Satan, the serpent, bringing us up to a certain point, and then he'll just step back. And what happens? Nine times out of ten, we make the choice to give in to it. He never forced her. He doesn't even say, try the fruit and see if I'm wrong. He doesn't even do that. He just brings her to the point. Then what's the second result of what happens when she sees the tree and it's desirable, desirable for wisdom. You know, first thing is she took its fruit and ate. What's the second result? Okay, she gave it then some to her husband. Now, I know most of you probably like me. You grew up in your mind, you see the pictures. There is the woman standing near the tree talking to the serpent and the man is nowhere to be seen. You know, we've always seen it as a conversation going on between the two of them. And then it's at this point that we've come to understand that the man, that the man then just kind of comes upon the situation, you know, that he comes upon it. But the truth is this. I have counted the word you, Y-O-U, that's been used seven times in the New Revised Standard Version of this story versus, I think it's one through four, one through five. I can't remember. But the word you is used seven times. Each and every one of those seven times, how do you think the writer writes the word you? He uses what? He puts it in the plural. Yeah, well, even she says, But see, that could have been something like we can, you know, Sandy could have been in another room and said, well, we can eat of it, you know, knowing I'm going to get her involved. The bottom line is, over years, we have kind of come to the assumption that Adam wasn't there or the man wasn't there, that he just kind of walks up on it. Or some people will have said that she takes it and takes it to him. She goes and finds it. The bottom line is this. It's written in the plural. This tells us then that the man has been actually doing what? Standing there and what? Watching, listening the entire time this has been going on. Which means what? That first off, he did nothing to what? To stop her. He didn't do anything to stop her. Secondly, that when the woman offered him the fruit, the man did not do what? He did not? Refuse to eat. He didn't resist. He didn't refuse to eat it, okay? He wanted it, what, just as badly as she did. But most important, it means that what? That the man is just as much what as the woman is? Guilty. guilty. She's ju he's just as guilty as she is, okay? Well, and that's what, yeah. Yeah, that's, and the thing is, that's, you know, the thing is, though, even though it hadn't been set up at that point, the bottom line is, oh, the man's supposed to be the spiritual leader. Well, he was just trying to believe. <laughs> <laughs> He's been doing what husband's been doing since the beginning of time, right? Well, we, we got to 
<laughs> but yeah, but how many years now has the woman gotten the blame and it's been put on all the other women in history throughout the world? Well, don't, no, we're going to get there. <laughs> don't jump to the fig leaves yet. Let's don't go there yet, okay? But the thing is, he's just as guilty. That's why, you know, that's why I'm always said, I've always said that from the very beginning. I've been here as your pastor. Don't blame just a woman. Don't blame just a serpent. Blame the man. Blame them all. And truthfully is, as the spiritual leader, as the head, as the first one created, he should have stopped it. And he's spoken to the grave. And he's being spoken to the grave. He's standing right there. But he wasn't on site when she got the apple or got the fish. Yeah, he was. He was standing right there with her. Every one of the use using this is in the plural form. Letting us know that he's speaking to both of them. That they're both there, okay? So guilt needs to be going all around to, all, to everybody, okay? But now look at verse 7. So as a result of them eating the fruit, what are the two things that now happen? Now, what does it first off say in your Bible? It says what? Your eyes, are open. Open. eyes are open. What else does it tell us? Yeah, they realized they, they were naked. And Miss Nail, what's your question about the fig leaves? How do you still that tiny scratch of your hand? <laughs> well, <laughs> hopefully they were soft ones. <laughs> Hopefully that. Well, like I said, there, remember now, fig leaves over there are probably different than fig leaves over here, right. too, as well. Different species and different plants and everything. But now, is that really what's going on here? Their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. See, first thing is this. They have discovered that what the serpent, that what Satan has told them, once again, about being like God is actually a true statement. They are like God because they now, they not only can see it, but they're now what? They can understand it. They can acknowledge the difference between good and evil. So they have now gotten the what that they desire? The wisdom. The wisdom, the wisdom that as they're there looking at that tree, desire for the wisdom. They got it now. And they're like God. They are not God. Remember, there's always difference. We're created in the image of God, but we are not God. Okay? They are now like God, and they got what they asked for. They got what they wanted, okay? Which happens to all of us, doesn't it? <laughs> How many times have you gotten what you asked for? You know? But the second thing is this. It was also at this moment that they have now discovered a half-truth that the serpent or the Satan has told them. See, in the story, verses 1 through 7, where is the half-truth? It's somewhere in these verses. There's a half-truth that the devil has told them. It's now come to be. Or, as Jack would say, there's a half-lie <laughs> that he's told them. Now, where would that be in this story? There's a half-truth, or you can say a half-lie, that he has now told the woman, and since we know he's there, the man. You can find it in first. Go ahead. You will not surely die. All right. Very verse 4. You will not die. Some versions, you will not surely or you shall not die. Okay? The truth is, at the moment that they eat of that, that's right. They are not physically dying. They're not about to physically die, but they're dying how now? Spiritually. Spiritually. That's what sin brings. Yeah, of course, sin can bring harm to the human, your physical body. But that's not his main desire. His main focus is to bring death to the spiritual part of who we are. Because the spiritual part is our what? Soul. It's our soul. But more importantly, it's our what? It's our connection to who? God. To God. That's what it wants to destroy. And for sure enough, even though at that moment, even though they were going to now die, the body, you know, all this is beginning to happen. But at that moment, he was right. They weren't going to die. He just didn't say the spiritual. He didn't say physical. He didn't say spiritual. Once again, he's smart, y'all. He's smart. He knows exactly how to frame it, to make him look innocent, and for us to not see the big picture. That's another reason why we've got to trust in God. God sees what? 
the whole picture. God sees the big picture for each and every one of us. All right, so these are the things that's actually happened. But now let's conclude it all by looking at this because as we read now this event, there's one question that we must ask, that we actually need to ask. That question is this. What was it that actually brought the work of sin into this world? Is this about the two of them eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And the answer is yes, in a way. In a way, because them doing this brought about the act of what? Sin. Not, not just the sin, but there's a specific act of what? Disobedience. 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 See, up to this point, they've been obedient to God. They have now given in to the act of disobedience. But the truth is this is actually much more than that. It's actually much more than just this act of disobedience. Now, listen to what I'm about to tell you, okay? I, I love this. I, this is something I discovered this morning. Because I'm like y'all. I always thought it was just a simple act of disobedience. But you see, the knowledge of good and evil that the tree offered, it was to be received by the man and woman, not by actually eating of the fruit, as the man and the woman are led to believe. The true knowledge of the good and evil could only come about by not eating of the tree, not eating of the fruit. It doesn't come by eating. It can, it's supposed to come by not eating, okay? You see, God was never trying to keep anything away from them. He doesn't want to keep anything away from us unless he knows what? That it's bad for us. It could be something good, but he sees the big picture and he knows in the end it can be harmful to us. He can say no to that. But overall, God was never trying to keep anything away from the man and the woman. He wanted them to discover another great gift that he was giving to them. What's the other great gift that God has given us other than Jesus, other than the Holy Spirit, other than life, the gift of this world? There's another great gift that God has given to each and every person. It's the gift of what? Life without sin. Okay, life without sin. You well, you can, but you got to be perfect. <laughs> but there's something else that I'm looking for. Okay, but what what is that choice is about? It's about the gift of what? Freedom. Free or say it a different way, not freedom, but free will. This is about the gift of free will that God wanted to give to them. Once again, one commentator talked about God was tempting them, testing them. Once again, what James first off tells us in his, in his letter, God does not tempt us. God does not test us. And y'all know how I feel. I've already told you that. God doesn't test us. I do not believe that he gets up the morning and says, well, I'm going to test Sam Burton to see how he's going to react to this. God already knows. Remember what I've always said? God doesn't test us. God gives us an opportunity. An opportunity to do what? To trust in him. See, this is what it's about. It's about then this gift of free will. That through the gift of free will, making the choice to not give into the temptation. If they had not given into the temptation, then the man and the woman would have received what? They would have received the what? The wisdom that they wanted. They would have received the what? The true knowledge of what good and evil is all about. Never thought about it that way. If they had simply not given in, if she, if they had simply said no, then they would have gotten it. It would have been revealed to them. They would have now known the knowledge of good and evil. They'd have known the true difference and how the goodness of God's will, his plan for them, is there to help them to live the life that he's given them to the fullest. See, they also will discover the difference in how evil has only one desire, and that is to bring sin into our lives so that we will become what? We become eternally what? Separated from who? Separated from God. Always give it God now. <laughs> and that's what it's really about. So the thing is this. If the man and the woman had only trusted in God, they would have received what? The knowledge they were looking. They would have been, they'd had the knowledge of good and evil, the desire for wisdom that they always wanted in the first place. You think that they would have never been 
terms and all that. Yeah, I, well, I don't know. I mean, that's a different thing. But all I know is because we, you know, the thing is, it wasn't about eating, you know, the, eating that fruit wasn't going to give them knowledge of good and evil. It was never about that. It was about the fact if they had just said no. I mean, how many times have we and you not been tempted and we said no? We didn't give in to the temptation and we then discovered what? What really would have happened if we had given in to it? We can see the result. Because how many times, I know as a kid growing up, I hung around a lot of friends. I had some good Christian friends. I had some good not Christian friends. And there came a time, a choice, to where I had to make a choice of either going with those that were non-Christians or going with my Christian friends. And I can tell you today that the majority of the non-Christian friends ended up in jail, either through alcohol or selling drugs and things like that. My Christian friends are the ones that are still, you know, they're involved in the church and still have a relationship with God. And I can see the difference. Because I didn't say, I didn't give in to the temptation to go with them. They looked like they were always having fun. But I can tell you right now some of the hard stories of some of those guys that I could have hung out with. It would have been the same thing for Adam and Eve. I don't know what the end, what all the end results would have been. I don't know. I, I always say this, I'm glad they did. Because if not, then it, it would have been me. I would have been the one <laughs> that sinned and brought sin into the world. Because I, I, I know I would have messed up somehow. So I'm glad it, they, you know, it was them, I guess, in a way. But that's what it's all about. It's about that, you know, if they had just waited. So anyway, why don't we stop here now? We'll pick up with verse 8 and finish up. Hopefully get through. We'll look at the punishment and stuff in, in chapter 3. And then we're going to get into Cain and um, Abel. So I'm excited about all that as well. So anyway, thank you all so much. Thank you at home for being here with us. And hope you enjoy it. We'll join us next week. Once again, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And until we're together again, please take care and God bless. Goodbye.